Okay, so picture this with me. All of uh, like all of scientific knowledge is going to disappear. Poof. Wow. Yeah. Uh, everything. Everything gone. But there's a catch. We get to save one sentence, just one, for a future generation. Oh man, that's that's a tough one. Only one sentence. One sentence to save the world, basically. What would it be? Um. Well, it'd have to be something like really important, right? Something fundamental to like kickstart everything again. I think. I think I know where you're going with this. I think you do. It's got to be something that unlocks a whole lot more. Exactly. Like a seed for scientific understanding. Exactly. It's the atomic hypothesis. Ah, there it is. That single idea that everything around us is made up of these tiny, constantly moving things called atoms, that's the key to understanding so much about the universe. From why ice melts to, to how we smell, you know, freshly baked cookies. Mm. Cookies. Yeah. All right. It all comes back to atoms. It all comes back to atoms. It's like um, it's like Feynman says, you know, understanding atoms is like having this incredible decoder ring for the universe. Yeah. You can unlock so many secrets with that one key piece of knowledge. It's true. And speaking of mind blowing, did you see that bit in the Feynman lectures about the scale of atoms? Oh yeah. How could I forget that one? He says, imagine blowing an apple up to the size of the Earth. Okay, I'm picturing it. Okay, the atoms inside would be about the size of the original apple. It's wild. It's almost impossible to really wrap your head around how incredibly tiny we're talking about. Ah. Uh, but it, like, really puts things in perspective, right? It really, really does. Okay, yeah. so we've got these tiny atoms making up, well, everything. Everything, everything, everything. What I find fascinating is that they're not just, like, static. They're not just sitting still. Right, right. They're constantly moving, jiggling around, bumping into each other. It's like this constant dance party happening at like the atomic level. Yeah. And the temperature. That that's just that determines how energetic the dance moves are. Oh, I like that. So in my cup of hot coffee right now. Yes, yes. The water molecules are really rocking out. Exactly. They are really getting down. The hotter that coffee gets, the faster and faster those little water molecules are vi vibrating and bouncing around. Yeah, I know. And then eventually they're going to break free from their, their liquid bonds and become steam. Oh, okay. They escape into the air. Freedom. Okay, so that explains steam. What about a glass of water just sitting there? I mean, it doesn't seem like much action is happening. Ah, but you see, that's where it gets really, really interesting. Even in a seemingly still glass of water, you have this constant invisible exchange of water molecules happening. It's wild. Some molecules at the surface, they're always like they're gaining enough energy to break free, evaporate into the air, while others are like, nope, I'm going back down. They lose energy and condense back into the liquid. So it's like a, a constant two-way flow. Precisely. Like a two-way street. Yeah. Are these of these molecules going back? Dynamic equilibrium. That's what we like to call it, at least. Dynamic equilibrium. I love it. So it, is that the same principle at play when you cool down soup by blowing on it? You got it. It's exactly the same principle. Okay. I've always wondered about that. How does blowing on hot soup actually make it cooler? All right. Think about it. Mm -hmm. When you blow on your soup, you're encouraging more of those those hot, energetic water molecules at the surface to mm -hmm. to do their thing, to evaporate. And since those escaping molecules... Those little daredevils, they take some heat energy with them. The remaining soup, it cools down. Oh, wow. It's all just thermodynamics, really. It's amazing. It makes you realize how much is going on at this level that we just we just don't see. Oh, yeah. It's a whole hidden world. Speaking of d different states of matter, how does water go from a liquid to a solid, like forming those ice crystals? Ah, the magic of ice crystals. Well, remember those jiggling molecules we talked about? Yeah. It all comes back to them. As the temperature drops... Those water molecules, they start to slow down their dance, you know, moving less and less. And eventually they find their spots. They settle into this more like structured, organized arrangement. And that, my friend, is the crystalline structure of ice. So those ice crystals, they can be so intricate, so beautiful. Like you see the six-sided snowflakes or those delicate frost patterns. It's amazing, isn't it? It's incredible how these really specific shapes just emerge from, from tiny atoms arranging themselves in this in this particular way. It's like they know exactly what they're doing. Wait, but doesn't that organized structure mean that ice is more densely packed than water? Ah, now that's the surprising part. You see, the way those water molecules arrange themselves in ice, it actually creates more empty space than in liquid water. Yep. More wiggle room in the solid state, who would have thought? So that's that's why ice floats. It's less dense than liquid water. Dingo. 
You got it. Even though it just seems so counterintuitive. I know, right? It's one of those things that, like, once you learn it, you're you're kind of amazed you didn't know it before. It's true. It's true. So, okay, this idea of atomic arrangements, then, it's key to understanding the difference between solids, liquids, and gases, like, <laughs> in general. Then, yeah, then. absolutely. Yeah. It's all about how those atoms and molecules are getting along, how much mm -hmm. freedom they've got to move around. So in solids, like our buddy, the ice cube, the atoms or molecules, they're locked into a fixed, organized structure. So like imagine like a, a perfectly organized drawer. I love that. Where everything has its place. Yes. Per perfect analogy. Then you have a liquid. Right. And the atoms are freer to move around. Right. More chaotic for sure. So that's more like a, a jumbled backpack, I'd say. Exactly. Just stuff everywhere. And then of course you've got gases where those atoms are practically bouncing off the walls. Which is wild. No structure, no organization, just pure chaotic energy. So we've got solids with their fixed structures. We've got liquids with their flowing nature, gases with their boundless energy. What happens when we start bringing different substances together, like right. dissolving salt in water. What's going on there at the atomic level? Ooh, now you're talking. Dissolving, it's like a whole other world of atomic interactions. Okay, so picture this. You drop some salt into a glass of water. Okay. Those little water molecules, they're constantly jiggling and bouncing around, remember? Right, they never stop. Never. <laughs> so they start to surround the individual sodium and chloride ions, you know, the ones that make up the salt crystal. So those water molecules, are they like little battering rams breaking the salt apart? In a way, yeah. They're like, all right, salt, time to break this party up. Mm. The water molecules, they, they neutralize the electrical attraction that holds those sodium and chloride ions together in the crystal. Oh. Okay. So they're free to, to disperse throughout the water. Fascinating. But isn't it true that some of those dissolved salt ions can like reattach to the crystal? Ah, you're good. You're absolutely right. It's a two-way street. Okay. While some ions are breaking away and dissolving, others might be like, you know what? This crystal life isn't so bad. Bump into the salt crystal and reattach. So it's all about finding that balance. Exactly. How many ions are leaving, how many are returning. It's this constant dance, a never-ending saga. So it's like a dance between dissolving and crystallizing. How does temperature play into this whole dance? Ah, uh, temperature, the ultimate party pooper or the life of the party, depending on who you ask. Mm -hmm. So much like with evaporation, changing the temperature can either, you know, speed up or slow down the rate of dissolving. Okay, so some substances. Some substances just love to dissolve in hot water. Others are more like, no, thank you. I prefer it cool and refreshing. Mm -hmm. They actually dissolve better at cooler temperatures. It's all very specific. It all depends on the substance, you know, and the interplay of energy at the molecular level. Okay, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Whether it's water evaporating, ice melting, or salt dissolving, it's all this delicate dance of atoms and energy constantly shifting, constantly interacting. It makes you realize that even the most ordinary things are full of these hidden complexities. Right. There's a whole universe happening right under our noses. It's incredible. Speaking of hidden complexities, let's talk about something even more fascinating. How do these tiny atoms and molecules create something as incredible as our sense of smell? Ah, the power of scent. <laughs> now we're venturing into the fascinating world of molecules and how they interact with our senses. Buckle up. I'm ready. So, for example, how do we go from, like, a bunch of atoms to, say, the sweet scent of violets after a spring rain? Okay. So, just like everything else we've talked about, it all comes down to, you guessed it, chance in motion. Those scent molecules, in this case, the ones that give violets their signature fragrance, they're just randomly bouncing around in the air. Okay. And by... If you're a chance, some of them eventually bump into, well, our noses. It seems random. It seems completely random. Because it is. It really is just a matter of those molecules being in the right place at the right time. But what happens once those molecules reach our noses, that's where things get really, really interesting. So those scent molecules just bump into our noses, and then what? It's not like they just like ring a little doorbell in our nose that says, hey, Violet's here, so what's going on there? Oh, it's way more intricate than a doorbell, trust me. <laughs> our olfactory system, you know, that's the fancy name for our sense of smell. Right. It's, it's incredibly complex. Remember how we were talking about atoms arranging themselves in those specific ways? Yeah. That's super important here, too. Okay, so how does that tie into, like, how we smell things? Okay, so picture this. Those scent molecules, right? Yeah. Each one, it has its own unique shape. Okay. And get this, they fit into specific receptors in our noses. 
Oh, wow. Kind of like a lock and key. Oh, interesting. So a violet scent molecule has like a specific shape that fits a specific violet receptor in my nose. Exactly. You got it. And when that perfect match happens, boom, it triggers a signal that travels to our brain, which then like decodes it and says, ah, violets. It's incredible. Our senses are just like they rely on these tiny molecular interactions. It's mind blowing. It reminds me of that part in the Feynman lectures where he talks about like the molecule that gives violets their scent. He was saying like figuring out the structure of that molecule. Oh, man, it was it was a huge task. Oh, yeah. It was a real puzzle for chemists back then. They had to like use all their knowledge of chemical reactions, tons of trial and error to figure out just how those atoms were arranged in that molecule. And and to think they did all that without even being able to see the molecules. Yeah. It's like trying to put together a puzzle, right. but in the dark. Right. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah. And speaking of puzzles, Feynman mentions that back then, physicists, they were a bit skeptical of chemists. You yeah. know? Oh, right. They, th they thought chemists were making things too complicated with all this talk of molecular structures. Oh, wow. Yeah, but guess what? The chemists, they had the last laugh. They were right all along. They were. Because, you see, eventually technology caught up and physicists, they could finally see these molecules. Oh, wow. And surprise, surprise, the chemists had nailed it. They had accurately predicted the structure of these molecules without even being able to see them. That's amazing. Talk about vindication. Right? It just goes to show you the power of observation, experimentation, and maybe a little bit of intuition, Why too. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. It makes you wonder, though, if we can't actually see these atoms directly, how do we really know they're there? I mean, we can't just put them under a microscope and be like, aha, there you are. You're getting on a really important point. We can't see atoms directly, not in the way we see, you know, most things. But we have tons of evidence for their existence. Remember that brownie emotion we talked about earlier? Right, right. The, the tiny particles just randomly dribbling around. That's the one. That seemingly random jiggling, it's actually caused by atoms. Those tiny particles, they're constantly being bombarded by even tinier water molecules. We can't see them, but they're there. It's like an invisible mosh pit at the atomic level. Whoa. So each collision causes the, the visible particle to move, and that's what we see. Exactly. So even though we can't see the atoms themselves, we see their impact on the world around them. Oh, that's so cool. It's like, it's like knowing there's a party going on because you can hear the music, even if you can't see inside. That's a great way to put it. And Brownian motion, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Remember those those perfectly formed crystals we talked about earlier? Yeah, like salt and ice with those beautiful like geometric shapes. Exactly. Those shapes, those are another piece of evidence for atoms. The specific angles and facets that we see in those crystals, they're a direct result of how the atoms are arranged inside. So wait, the shapes of crystals? They're not just pretty to look at. They actually tell us something about the way atoms are organized on the inside. You got it. The way crystals form, with those atoms locking into these repeating three-dimensional patterns, that dictates the shapes we see on the outside. It's like a giant atomic Lego set, where the building blocks are atoms, and the final structure, that's the crystal. And those angles, they align perfectly with like the theoretical arrangements of atoms. It's amazing. It's like having a blueprint of the invisible. That's incredible. It really is mind-blowing to think we can figure out so much about something we can't even see. It really speaks to the power of, of scientific thinking, doesn't it? It really does. So, okay, we've got this idea that everything's made of atoms, these tiny, constantly moving particles that we can't see directly, but we see their effects everywhere we look. From, from Brownian motion to the shapes of crystals, it all points back to the atomic hypothesis, which is, I mean, that's a pretty powerful idea, right? It's one of the most profound ideas in all of science. It mm -hmm. really makes you look at the world differently when you, when you grasp its implications. I can imagine. It's humbling almost to think that, that everything around us, a, a solid block of steel, the, the rushing water in a river, it's, it's all just a collection of these tiny particles interacting in ways we're only just starting to understand. But then it makes you wonder, if we're all just collections of atoms, what makes us so unique? What sets us apart from, I don't know, a rock or a glass of water? Uh, the million dollar question, right? What is life? Well, it all comes down to arrangement. Arrangement, but aren't we all just made of the same basic ingredients, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, a, a sprinkle of other elements. True, true. The basic ingredients, they're, they're pretty much the same. But it's the precise way those atoms are arranged, how they interact with each other, that makes all the difference. Okay, you've got to give me an example. I'm, I'm really curious now. Okay, okay. 
Imagine a set of building blocks, right? You can use that same set of blocks to build a simple tower, a sturdy wall, or even a, a complex castle, right? Yeah. It's the same idea with atoms. So the arrangement of the atoms, that's like a blueprint for complexity. The more complex the arrangement, the more complex the structure, whether it's a, a rock, a, a raindrop, or, or a human being. You got it. And when it comes to living things, those arrangements, they're always changing. They're responding to the environment, adapting, evolving. It's incredible. It's like that that never-ending dance we were talking about, but on this like grand, intricate scale. Exactly. It's it's a dance of life. And Aww. and that brings us to the heart of what makes life so remarkable. So it's it's really all about the arrangement. And these incredible arrangements of atoms are constantly changing and adapting to make life as we know it, right? Exactly. It's like this this hidden world, this microscopic world, it's driving the complexity of life. Fascinating, isn't it? It is. And and to think this whole journey into the atom, it all started with that one, well, pretty simple statement, really, the atomic hypothesis. It's incredible how such a simple idea can unlock so much. It's true. It's like that saying, sometimes the smallest things make the biggest difference. Exactly. And in this case, that small thing, the atom, is the foundation for everything. Everything we see, touch, smell, taste, feel, it all comes back to atoms. It really does. It's the building block of, well, us and everything around us. It's almost impossible to really wrap your head around, but, I mean, when you start to think about it, that everything, a sturdy piece of steel, the Russian water in a river, it's all just these tiny atoms all buzzing around, interacting. It puts things into perspective, doesn't it? It really makes you appreciate the elegance of it all the interconnectedness. It does. And it makes you realize that even though we've learned so much, we've come a long way in understanding atoms, we've still only scratched the surface, haven't we? Oh, absolutely. There's so much more to learn, so many mysteries left to unravel. That's the beauty of science, though, isn't it? It's a journey, mm. constant discovery. It really is. Every answer just leads to more questions. And that's what makes it so exciting. Well said. Well said. And on that note, we'll leave you with this thought-provoking question to ponder. If everything around us is just a collection of atoms, what incredible possibilities might still be hidden within those unique and complex arrangements, the arrangements found in living things? Until next time, keep exploring those hidden worlds.